you can be seated. <laughs> I went through the first song. It was like, okay, it's going to come up. And then I started the second song. I was like, it's going to come up. I know they're going to come up. I think he's plugging in. Josh, you want us to lead a hymn while we wait? When I in awesome wonder consider all the world's thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. How about you stand up now? <laughs> when through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. God, his son not sparing, sent him to die. I 
scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art when christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then i shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my god how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art josh y'all set Awesome. Let's start with he is.
through my mind a lot lately he's coming back and every time things have been getting st stressful um, obviously for me it's at school is pretty stressful um, I keep reminding myself that this isn't my end he is coming back again and I will have peace again we all will have peace again as crazy as it feels right now and to keep our eyes focused on the cross and on God song has kind of become the theme song for this month and I want to tell you a little bit of how
Different sections of scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy is sort of a retelling of what had happened uh, previously, a retelling of the law, some would call that. Here Moses is talking, he's uh, talking about Joshua, he's sharing with the children of Israel, and, he, and he's telling them some things that God had told him. So I'd like to pick up in verse uh, 26 of Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 26. Scripture says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day, that you shall soon utterly perish from off the land whereon till you go over Jordan to possess it. You shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations, and you shall be left few in number among the heathen, whether, whither the Lord shall lead you. And there you shall serve gods and work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell." 
But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, and thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul, when thou art in tribulation and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God and shalt be obedient unto his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swear unto them, and we'll stop there. Now, the children of Israel had seen God's mighty hand in their lives many, many times previous to this. They had seen his hand as he led them out of Egypt with all of the plagues, how they had crossed the Red Sea, and eventually how they're going to cross the Jordan, and just time and time again how God had made himself known to them in powerful, powerful ways. And Moses is saying, you know, you, you've seen all these things. He talks about that in the next few verses a little bit, how, how God made himself known to them, and yet... They turned away from him. They turned away from him. They, they didn't want to be obedient to what he had asked of them. And Moses is telling them, even when you get into the promised land, the land that you've been looking forward to, when you get in there, you're going to do the same thing. And you're going to be scattered. You're going to be dispersed. You're going to be taken to all different nations. You're going to be conquered. You're going to be serving uh, work of men's hands, serving idols, those countries do that. You're going to be in a place that you don't want to be. But remember this. I'm still God. <laughs> I'm still God. And if you turn your face to me, if you seek me, you will find me. You will find me. And the lesson, I think, that as I read those verses and as I came to mind was the fact that, you know, there are some times we, in our lives, at least I do, I get myself into trouble. I'm in a situation that I'm in. I find myself in a place and I'm, and I'm suffering. You can call it tribulation. You can call it suffering. You can call it struggling. You can call it whatever you want. But I'm there because of my decisions and the things that I've done. And there's no doubt about that. There's other times that we find, ourselves, we find ourselves in those kinds of situations, not necessarily because of anything that we have done, but simply because that's the way it is. But regardless of which way that is, God wants us to know that he is still God. He is still in control. And when I recognize that and when I, when I cry out to him, he hears me and he'll answer me. God has not removed himself from us just because there's some tribulation, just because there's some struggle, just because there's some things going on. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. He's always there. As I said, the next number of verses, I'm not going to read them from 32 to 38, talk about all the ways that, that God spoke to them, all the ways that he showed himself to them. And why does he do those things? Verse 39 says, Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart that the Lord, he is God, and heaven above and upon the earth beneath, there is none else. God is God. He is still God. And we can take heart in that. We can stand on that foundation. So let's pray again this morning, shall we? God, again, we come into your presence this morning, grateful that we have a God who is in control. Grateful that we have a God who is alive and well. Grateful that we have a God who is, who is powerful, who can do all things, even above and beyond our imagination, our thinking. And God, I thank you that you're a God who, in, even in the midst of the struggles and the challenges that we find ourselves, whether they're struggles or challenges that, that we bring upon ourselves or struggles or challenges that, that simply are a part of the world in which we live, God, that you're still in control, that you are still God. And when we cry out to you, when we seek your face, that you answer because you care, because you love. So God, remind us of that again, not just today, but in the days ahead, that you are a God who loves us, a God who cares about us, a God who is ever-present with us, and we'll thank you for that. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. And this time our choristers are going to... There shall be showers of blessing, this is the promise of love. There shall be refreshing, sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, 
Precious reviving again Over the hills and the valleys Sound from abundance of rain Showers of blessings Showers of blessings we need Mercy just from the start Send the light, 212.
Turb, I'd give him a minute or two so we could focus in on this because this is going to be the focal point of our object lesson. Um, when I was asked to do this, sometimes I have an idea what I want to do and then I'll go online and look for an idea. This time I didn't really know what I wanted to do, so I just looked for an object lesson that maybe had a good idea behind it. So, so that's what I did this time. Um, I don't know if Herbie's zoomed in yet. We'll give him another minute. I'll just have to, um, I don't know what I'll talk about, but maybe I'll start out by introducing my friend. My friend here is, is Bob, Bob the Bobber. And as, as he zooms in, I'd like to here and maybe yeah it's probably good and Bob and Bob here he, he's very obedient he he pretty much does whatever I ask him to do um, he always listens who here wants to see Bob listen to me and be be obedient does anyone want to see this okay everyone okay Herbie's ready so okay Bob I want you to go down look at that can you see that up there okay now Bob go up Oh, look at that. Perfect. Okay, now, Bob, go down halfway. Oh, look at that. Oh, well, you went a little too far, but there you go. See if you can stay right in one spot. Look at that. Okay, go up. All right, go down. And then uh, let's go back up. There you go. Look at that. Bob is perfectly obedient. He does whatever I ask him to do. Some, some of you all probably have already figured it out, but if not, it's on YouTube. You can find it. Um, now, now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come down with the microphone, and I'm going to ask children some questions. I'll hang on to the microphone. I'll probably pull my mask up just out of respect. Um, how many? So, Bobble's obedient to me. Who, who knows who that we should be obedient to? There's no wrong answer, but... Maybe an answer I'm looking for. God. That's a, that's a good answer. Any other answers? There's other good answers. Our parent. Our parents. They are the two I wanted to concentrate on this morning. Thank you. Um, Ephesians 6 1 says. says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is, a right, this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Um, what happens when we are not obedient to our parents? Anyone, anyone want to shout out what happens when we're not good, obedient to our parents? You get spanked. <laughs> you get spanked. I was afraid. I told my wife I wanted to go out and kids, but I thought maybe I shouldn't. That um, might get a little too specific. Parents might be unique in their punishments. But I, I had written down, likely you'll be punished, and I thought spanking, time out, maybe extra chores. It is important to remember that parents, it is important to remember that our parents will forgive us of our disobedience. Our parents may also reward us for corrected behavior, and God promises us Long life if, if obedient to this command. What about God? If we are not obedient to him. Anyone know what, what happens when we're not obedient to God? Any volunteers? Might, this might be a trickier question. I wrote down that disobedience to God is sin. And does anyone know what the punishment for sin is? I know a lot of kids should know. I'll even run out in the audience again. I think it keeps the kids involved. Death. Death, that is correct. That's what I had written down. Anyone want, anyone know Romans 6.23? Any of the Awana kids or other kids that want to say it? Anyone over here? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Thank you for that. Um, so the, the punishment is said right away there. The, the punishment is death. 
So if we sin, if we're disobedient, we're punished by death. But the reward is the very next thing that is said in Romans 6, 23. And the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So our gift for obedience to, to God is heaven. And I think we all would rather go to heaven than the alternative. How can we be sure, how can we know we will get our reward? And I wanted to read Romans 10, 9 and 10. That says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And I'm going to end with this. This is the ultimate obedience. It is so easy, it is hard. But I pray we are all obedient and willing to confess Jesus is Lord. And that's all. for the message that you've laid on his heart. We pray your special anointing of power and just might upon his uh, voice and upon his mind right now. God, as he shares that with us, help him to share it without fear or favor of man. God, help us to receive it as your word, put it into practice in our hearts and in our lives. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Well, good morning. It is a good thing to be here. It's nice to continue to meet as a body of Christ, to be able to get together, to be able to to talk to each other, to be able to see each other, to be able to be encouraged by each other and and sing praises and worship our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ. It's been been an interesting last few weeks and uh, it's been, I don't think it's going to stop being interesting. Um, We live in some pretty interesting times today and just continue to pray for our leadership Um, here at the church, continue to pray for the leadership in our county, in our state, as more and more decisions need to be made and continue to need need to be made. Continue to pray for them and lift them up. This morning we're going to continue moving on in our sermon series through the book of Ephesians, and we are almost done with chapter 4. It feels like we've been going on this for a long time, and we really have, but we've only got two chapters left, and these next two chapters are going to be um, they're going to take a little, little while. They're going to take a little while. There's a lot of stuff in these next two chapters, but not looking ahead, not jumping ahead too far. Let's look at our, our verses today. Kind of a little bit of a review of where we've been. Last time I preached, we talked about putting off the old and putting on the new. Or if you remember me bringing my work coat in and changing my coat through the message to signify the old clothes all the old things that we had in our lives before we came, became believers. We looked at what it looked like before we were believers, looked at some characteristics of those who are not in Christ, those who are still wearing the old clothes, and then we move forward into what it looks like to put on the new. The importance of not just putting the new over top of the old, but getting rid of those old clothes and putting on the new clothes, and they're fresh, they're clean. We understood that they're going to get some spots on them, they're going to get some wrinkles in them, they're going to get a little dirty. But knowing that we have a Savior in Jesus who washes those clothes, we don't have to. He gets the stains out and we can continue living a godly life for Him. With that in mind, we have to ask ourselves a question. Moving forward from putting on new clothes, we have to ask a question of now what? Now what do we do? We've got these new clothes on, we've understood what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ, so we have to ask, now what? This morning I entitled my message, this is going to be a two-part kind of message on, on conflict, on communication. This, this Sunday we're going to talk about communication and conflict, but the next message I preach, Lord willing, I'll be able to talk about peacemaking and forgiveness. What does that look like? And as we go through these verses this morning, I was just, as I went through them studying, I was just super challenged as to what does it mean to really communicate in conflict? Because I can pretty much guarantee that we've all been in conflict. One way, shape, or form. If you've been on this earth very long, you've had conflict with somebody. You've had to deal with that conflict. You've had to talk through conflict. You've had to understand what the other person is going through and what you're going through and kind of process it all and and move forward from that. But these verses this morning are just jam-packed with good advice for communicating in conflict. So, with that said, some questions I want you to think about. 
This is for you personally, okay? How do you handle conflict? When you, even when you hear that word, or when you hear the idea of an argument or disagreement, how do you handle that? How do you begin to process it? There are many different ways we handle conflict in life, and each person handles it differently. There are some who run from it. They hear the word conflict, and they want us to get as far away from it as they possibly can. There are some that clam up. When they get in conflict, it's, they, they get quiet. There are some, when they get in conflict, they open up, and they really let you know what they think. There are some that go into conflict, and, and they like to deal with it. They like to get it over with. They like to move on. They like to move into the peacemaking end of conflict. How do you handle conflict? How do you handle disagreements? Now, with thinking of that in that context, let's move into the church. Because we're all part of the church. How do we as a church handle conflict? Because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. We've looked at it earlier in this chapter when we talked about unity in, in the church, you're going to have varying opinions, very, very uh, ideas, ways of doing things, even theologies. We've got to mesh all that together. We've got to figure out how to get into one position so we can move together unified and ready to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in the task that he's asking us to do. But in that, we will find ourselves in conflict. There will be disagreements. How do we handle that? The one thing I don't want to focus on this morning is conflict. I want to focus on how we handle it, how we actually handle the conflict. So let's read these verses. Everybody stand this morning as we read the Word of God. We're going to read Ephesians chapter 4. Let's look at verses 25 through 31 this morning. Word of God says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that, me, that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Let's pray. Father God, again, we give you thanks for your word. We thank you for how good you are. We thank you that you have given us instruction in your word. This morning, Lord, as we dive into this, this topic of conflict and communication and conflict, we pray for clarity. We pray that you would show us how we are to handle conflict. We thank you that you've laid out a map, that you've laid out a guide for us. We pray this morning as we look at your word that you would enlighten our hearts, that you would come, and that you would rest on us this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. There's a story I want to read this morning to you. There was once an Englishman and a Scotsman who lived next door to each other. The Englishman owed, owned a, a hen. And each morning, he would look in his garden and pick up the egg that the hen would lay. He would use them for breakfast and, and, and keep them throughout the day and use them whenever he would need them. Well, one day, he looked out in his garden. He saw the hen that had laid his he its egg in the neighbor, the Scotsman, his garden. So he was about to go next door and go pick up the egg when he looked out his window and saw the Scotsman run over and pick up the egg out of his garden. The Scotsman... The Englishman walked up to him and, and said, hey, hey, what are you doing? That's my egg. The Scotsman said, no, 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 that's on my property, it's my egg. So they had this disagreement, they had this conflict. Well, the Englishman said, well, in my family we have a way of solving conflict. He said, the, what we'll do is first I'm going to stomp on your foot as hard as I possibly can. You're going to take your shoe off and I'm going to stomp on your foot as hard as I possibly can. And then we're going to count how long it takes for you to get up off the ground and get back to your feet and recover. And then you do it to me. Whoever stays on the ground longest loses. So whoever can recover quickest, get to their feet, will get the egg. The Scotsman agreed and said, no, that sounds like a good idea. So he let the Englishman go first. The Englishman ran inside, got his heaviest pair of work boots on, 
came outside. The Scotsman had his shoe off. He was standing there. He said, all right, I'm ready. The Englishman ran up as fast as he could, jumped as high as he could, landed with the heel of his boot right on the foot, right on the foot of the Scotsman. The Scotsman went down into a ball and started crying and wailing and screaming and holding his foot. And he was down for about 30 minutes. He was in agony. He was in pain. And finally, he stood up. He got to his feet. He regained his composure. He thought, okay, now I can do it. He said, okay, now it's my turn. The Englishman looked at him and said, no, that's okay. You can keep the egg. In life, we have conflict. And as funny as that story is, sadly, sometimes we do the same thing. Sometimes, in conflict, we stomp on the other person's foot, and then when it comes time to actually talking about it, we tail it the other way. We don't want to deal with it. We don't want to talk about it. We, want, we don't want to work through it. We don't want to communicate because we did what we wanted to do. So this morning, we're going to look at three ways that we can communicate through conflict. The first one we're going to look at is to be honest. We find that in verse 25 Paul writes, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Honesty and conflict is the key to resolving any disagreement. You cannot get any further in a disagreement if you're going to present falsehoods or if you're going to lie. It doesn't work. Paul starts by saying, put, therefore, having put away falsehoods. He's saying this because he's talking to Christians. This idea of having put away falsehood is a past tense phrase. He said, you've already done this. You've already put away falsehoods. Going back to what we looked at last time with putting off the old. That's gone, right? Those old clothes are off. You're ready. You're putting on the new clothes. You're clean. You're ready to deal with conflict. Paul says, putting it away. Why does he tell us that? Because truth is key. Now, in the area of conflict, the idea of falsehood can look different to different people. Sometimes it means we lie outright. We don't tell the truth. Sometimes it means that we are going to make maybe a partial truth. Maybe we see it one way and we, we kind of elaborate a little bit in our mind and we don't really tell the truth. We, we stretch it a little bit and make it sound a little bit different than what it really was. And sometimes... It can mean that we just don't deal with it. That's a sense, and that's a type of falsehood, of just saying, you know what, it's not there. There's no conflict there. I don't need to talk about it. I don't need to, to deal with it. All of these are under the pretext of falsehoods. And as a believer, it's our job to put these off. Paul moves then into the action part of the verse. He says, let, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Now, what does this mean? This verse can get people in a lot of trouble, especially when it's isolated. Speak the truth to your neighbor. How do we speak the truth to our neighbor? Does that mean we can just say whatever we want? Does that mean we just, whatever's up here just comes out here and it doesn't matter, there's no filter? What does it mean to speak the truth to our neighbor? Well, let's look at that this morning. The first word he says here is speak. Speak the truth. Now, this word in the Greek is an active, not a passive word. That means we have to open our mouths. The importance of speaking the truth is actually speaking the speaking part of the truth. People can't read minds. I'm not good at it. I try every once in a while. It gets me in trouble. We have to speak the truth. If there's a conflict between you and another brother or sister in the church or in your home or in your workplace, you, when you are approached by that person or when you have an opportunity to approach that person, you actually need to speak. You need to share with them. Again, putting away falsehoods. We need to speak that truth. We can't say nothing. It doesn't work. Sometimes in, in, at my house, my wife will ask me if I'm not doing well or if I look like I've had a rough day. She'll say, oh, you know, what, is there something wrong? Well, there's my opportunity. I get to speak, right? There's a lot of times I look at her and say, nothing, I'm good. She sees through it pretty quick. 
And I think each one of us can relate to that a little bit too. It's pretty easy to see through when something isn't good, right? You can't even lie about it. It doesn't work. We have to speak. Now, this doesn't just give us a license to just lash out and make accusations against that per- person. Look back at chapter 4, verse 15, just a few verses back. Paul writes there, rather speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. We are to speak the truth in what? Love. We are to speak the truth in love. Here is where the discipline comes in. Because sometimes it's easy to just open our mouth up and just let it out. But there's a filter that we need to go through, and that filter is love. It is important for us to do that. Now what does this mean? What does it mean to speak the truth in love? It means that when we are speaking to each other in a conflict, that we have the other person's best interest in mind. We have resolution in mind. Look at Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. Turn there, just a few pages over. Paul writes, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Our speech is a direct reflection of our heart. Our speech is always a reflection of our heart. If our speech is negative, we have some negative things going on in our heart. If it's positive, our heart's positive. If it's filled with anger, then our heart has anger. Our speech will reflect what's going on in our heart. And usually, what's going on in our heart depends on what's going on in our spiritual life. Depends on what our walk looks like with Christ. Now I understand there's situations, there's instances where you've been hurt. Where you've been hurt. Where you may have not done anything wrong. And in those situations, you might feel, and and maybe, maybe this is just me, but I feel like I'm justified to just let it out. To say, you know what? I was wronged. This is why I'm acting this way. This is what I can say. And it's almost this justification that it's okay. I can just let it all fly. That's not what the Bible says. Let your speech be gracious. Always be gracious. Seasoned with salt. How do we speak when we get the chance? What does our speech look like? In Proverbs chapter 15, 1, it says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Such a practical verse, and I'm sure we've all seen this played out in our lives. We've all seen this played out in our lives. So what does our speech look like? The second part of this verse is the cause of why we are speaking this way. It says that we are members together. We are members together. We, as a church, are a family. We're a family. Now, does that mean that everybody in the family always gets along? Think about this. Think about your house. Does everybody always get along? No. Now, in fact, sometimes I feel like I spend more time trying to keep people getting along and and dissolving arguments than than is just happy-go-lucky and everything goes well. Family is being responsible to each other, and we have the same end goal. As a family unit, in my family, in my house, we are responsible for each other. We look out for each other. We don't just run away from each other when things don't work. We love each other. In church this morning, the person sitting next to you is your family member. You guys are family. And the person sitting here that's your best friend, he's your family, she's your family. And the person sitting here who you don't get along with is your family. They are your family. There are people that we struggle with. Personalities sometimes don't work. They don't mesh. But that doesn't give us the right to not acknowledge them as family, to not look out for their best, to not deal with conflict if there's conflict there. And this is why it's so important to communicate in conflict. Because it's easy to get things wedged in. And that's where we're going to move into the next point in communication and conflict. And that is found in verses 26 and 27. And that is keeping current. Paul says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not the sun, don't let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now, I don't see it as a coincidence that Paul starts 
right after he talks about putting away falsehoods and speaking, speaking your, the truth with your neighbor, moving into anger. I don't see that as a coincidence. Because the natural progression in conflict, if somebody comes up to you and approaches you about something, is your responsibility. You can't control what they say, but you can control your responsibility, you can control your reaction to it. And in this sense, Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Now he has some pretty strong words here, doesn't he? He begins by saying, be angry and do not sin. What does this mean? What does it mean to be angry and not sin? Paul here is pointing out that not all of our anger is wrong. In fact, the words, be angry, actually gives us the right to be angry. It doesn't say, never get, never get angry. In fact, we can't even see Jesus model that. In Mark chapter 2, in John chapter, or Mark chapter, yeah, I believe it's Mark chapter 2, verse 5, we see Jesus getting angry at the Pharisees. He could see in their hearts. He was getting angry with them because he could see that they were just completely hip- hypocrites. We see in John chapter 2, we see him getting angry at the people in the, court, in the temple. We see him going to them, tipping over the table, driving, driving them out, making a whip of cords, a cord of whips. Like, you can't do that without a little bit of anger. But the difference is not that we get angry, it's what is our motivation and what is our goal when we get angry. I would venture to say this morning that most of our anger is sinful. I'm certainly not giving any of us a license just to get angry. Most of our anger is sinful because a lot of times we get angry because what somebody else did infringes on what I think is right. Somebody else invaded my kingdom, right? We all have kingdoms in our lives. We all have ideas of things that, how things should go. And when somebody invades that or doesn't follow along where, where I think my kingdom needs to be, I get angry to them. That's a selfish motivation. It's the object and the motive that makes the difference, always makes the difference. If the object is sin or the things that God gets angry at, then it's righteous anger. Then it's okay. And this is the anger we're supposed to have. Now, even if we're angry at the right things, we've got to be careful. We have to be careful. It's not just the object, remember, it's not just the object that is okay to be angry at or how we handle it, That's, that could be sin or not sin. It's our response to that anger. We can be mad at abortion because abortion is sin and it grieves the heart of God that does not give us the right to go out and harm people that get abortions. Does not give us the right to go out and burn down abortion clinics. You see, it's our response and our motive and our goal and what's going on in our hearts. Our reaction is key in how our anger, even if it's righteous, can lead to sin. So Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Then he moves into another phrase, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Or in some versions, it says wrath. Now, I used to look at this verse and say, well, that means i got to get all my problems fixed before I go to bed at night. And there's some days I wouldn't sleep. There's probably some days you wouldn't sleep. Is that what this verse is saying? Does that mean that every conflict we have needs to be settled before we go to bed? As you read this verse, as I read it again and really looked at it, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. It says, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Not your conflict. Not the issue. On your anger. I believe what Paul is telling us here is not to allow your anger to fester and stay there. Deal with it. Deal with that anger. Don't go to sleep with that anger on your heart. Now, there's a lot of verses in Scripture that warn us about the danger of anger, of prolonged anger, of anger that's allowed to take root in somebody's heart. And one that sticks out to me is in Genesis chapter 4, verses 2 through 8. Turn there this morning. It's one of the first examples of anger in Scripture that was allowed to take root. Very familiar story, but I want you to catch the words of this story. It says, Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flocks and of their fat portions. 
And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you, oh, and if, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to his brother Abel. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Anger that took root in one man's heart led to the first murder in the history of the world. Because of anger. Because he let the sun go down on his anger, or on his wrath. Cain did not deal with it. In fact, God even warns him that sin is crouching at your door. It's there. If you don't deal with it, it's going to turn into something worse. Abel's, or Cain's anger ruled him. He did not deal with it which led to bitterness and ultimately a death. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to plead with you this morning, keep current with your anger. And this is just as much for me. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. If there's somebody that you're angry with, if there's a situation that you're angry with, deal with it before you go to bed. It may not mean that the conflict can get fixed, but that's not what it's telling us to do. It want, God wants us to keep our anger current. Be done with it when the day's done. Sometimes that, spend, that means spending some time detaching yourself from things and focusing on His Word. Sometimes that means detaching ourselves from things and praying. But ultimately what it means is that we have to deal with it. We can't shove it to the back part of our brain, and I know as a guy, I'm really good at this, to shove that thing to the back of my brain and say, well, I'll deal with it in the morning. It'll be there. Yes, it will. And so won't your anger. Deal with that anger while you can. And if there's somebody in the church that you're angry with, please deal with that anger and work towards forgiveness with that person. Now, I'm not saying this morning, as this example of Cain and Abel, that every single time you get angry with somebody, that's going to lead to death. That's obviously not true. But Jesus makes it very clear that he's not always talking about physical death in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 through 24. We see that in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. And then Jesus makes a twist. He says, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. Whoever says you fool will be liable to, the hell, to, the hell, to hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift to the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there at the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. Notice how in verse 23 and 24, it's not talking about if you have hurt somebody so much as, as, if, as if it says, if you, uh, where was it here? I lost it. If you are offering your gift to the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, go deal with it. Conflict means we have to communicate. That means we have to sometimes stop what we're doing no matter how important it is and deal with it. Because if the sun continues to go down on that anger, it will root in our heart, it will create bitterness, and we will have issues. Life will not be good. I can can guarantee that. It's so important in conflict that we remember the grave consequences of anger that take root in our life. And anger that is left over a period of time turned into a playground for Satan. And he will, he will come there. And he will take a foothold in your life and he can take a foothold in the church and he can wreak havoc. If you haven't dealt with your anger towards another person, you are playing with fire. You are praying, playing with fire. Allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart. Allow him to point out maybe those places, those people, those situations that you have gotten angry with and deal with them. But do it before the sun goes down. Paul moves on to an example of an issue that was going on in the Ephesians church in verse 28 of Ephesians chapter 4. He says, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Now when I read this, I thought, how does this fit in? 
Like he's talking about speech, and then he jumps into this, and then he goes back into speech after this. Why is this here? Wouldn't it fit better somewhere else in in the text? Well, keeping with the context of what we're talking about here, especially in dealing with the whole put off and put on principle, he's dealing with that same thing right here. He says, let the thief no longer steal. Put off stealing. Put off stealing and put on a good work ethic. Now, I know this isn't what he's talking about here, and I don't, I'm not intentionally taking the Bible out of context, but there is some things in our lives that we get angry with that have to do with people not working and getting things. There are situations, there's government programs, there's different institutions that are made that deal with this issue. And I know Paul wasn't writing this to the Ephesians church about this issue, but this morning, just work with me on it. In our lives, we're going to have an opportunity to get angry at people that we may never, ever talk to. That we may never have an opportunity to talk to. But we get mad at them, and we get mad at the situation, and we just let it there. We don't, we don't deal with it. Because they should get out and work. And as 100% as I agree with that, and it agrees with Scripture, does that give us the right to get angry? Does that give us a right to hold that anger? Does that give us a right to just let it fester, get bitter, and just neglect them? Or don't even want to deal with it? I don't think so. I don't think so. Paul's making a very clear point that there's people in the church that you may not agree with, the way they're doing things, especially in this situation. They may be wrong. But that doesn't mean we neglect them. That doesn't mean we just put it to the back and never deal with it. What's he say? He says, let them work with their hands so that they can contribute. So that they can give back to the church, to the community, to the people around them. Now, I know we can't fix certain situations where this is, this is happening in our society, in our community, in our country. But in the same sense, we still don't have the right just to get angry and leave it alone. We have to deal with that anger. We have to make sure that we keep it current. Now, as we move on into the next section, we see the third way that we deal with conflict and we deal with communication and conflict, and that is found in verses 29 through 31, and that is that we build up and we don't tear down. Paul writes, Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but such is only as good as for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Paul starts out, verse 29, by telling us not to let any corrupt talk come from our mouth. Now, what is corrupt talk? What is corrupt talk? I know different translations translate that word a little bit differently. All of them kind of mean the same thing. What is corrupt talk? Corrupt talk in conflict actually bypasses the real issue and attacks the character of the individual that you're dealing with. It bypasses the issue and it goes straight for the character. That's corrupt talk. Look at the rest of verse 29. I think that backs it up. It says, but only, it's talking about speech, such is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Now this is, that's the opposite of corrupt talk. We have to be so careful that when we're dealing with conflict that we are actually attacking the issue and not the person, especially when we're trying to communicate. How well does that go? How well does that go when you start attacking the actual person? Usually it just ends up, you just get in a headbutt match. Things never get resolved. Things don't get accomplished at all. And we do this by looking at what we disagree about the, what we disagree with in the person versus the person that you are disagreeing with. That's how we can beat corrupt talk. Now, how can we stay focused on not doing corrupt talk? How can we stay focused on attacking the issue and not the person? James chapter 1, verses 19 through 20 is a common verse. Most of us know it. James says, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of God does not produce the righteousness of God. Notice James even deals with the the connection of communication and anger and how they can so closely link. 
Now, this is a discipline. This is a discipline, and it's not easy to do. These three things have been so hard in my own life, being quick to hear, being slow to speak, and slow to anger. Usually, I want to get my point across. That's the point, right? When you're in an argument, you want to make sure you're heard. That's not what Paul is talking about in Ephesians 4. That's not what James is talking about here. Our natural reaction is to get our point across, is to make sure that we're right, that maybe even we dominate the conversation. Sometimes we dominate it because maybe we don't want to hear the other side. Maybe we don't want to have to face it. Maybe we don't want to have to to deal with the actual issue. But our response to conflict has a massive implication on our relationship with the Holy Spirit. He says it here. He says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. How we communicate in conflict can really have an effect on how the Holy Spirit can convict and how it can work in our own personal lives. Paul reminds those people here in Ephesians and us that our responsibility is not to disappoint the the Holy Spirit by the way we live and speak to each other and that our privilege is a promised future. It says that we're sealed by that same Holy Spirit. Then he wraps this whole concept of communication up with verse 31. He says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Again, this is a list of things that we need to put off. A list of things that he's kind of tying in with the previous part of the chapter that we're supposed to put off. But especially in communication during conflict. Bitterness. What is bitterness? It's holding a grudge. Wrath. That's explosive anger. That's anger that just lets it all out with no filter. Clamor. When we clamor, we're just getting into a yelling match. Slander. Slander is injuring somebody else's character intentionally. That's attacking the person, not the problem. And malice, which is a desire to actually harm someone. And we may think that, well, our conflicts won't get there, or my conflict with this person won't get there. But brothers and sisters, there's been many, many church splits and hurt, physical hurt, pain in relationships because conflict has not been communicated well. Because it's bypassed all of those things and malice ends up happening. And physical harm doesn't always mean you punch somebody. It doesn't mean you physically hurt them. There's a lot of spiritual, emotional, and physical pain that happens when communication isn't present in conflict. That's what Paul's getting at here. Paul's entire goal in this section is to reflect the unity and love that's in Christ Jesus. That's the point of the church. That's the point of the church. A lack of Christ-like communication in conflict has been a driving force in a lot of destroyed relationships. And we have a choice to make this morning. We always have a choice to make in conflict. Are we going to handle it by communicating? And not just communicating the way we think we should or the way we want, but communicating by the way that Scripture tells us to. Are we going to be honest by speaking the truth in love and by realizing that the people in here are members one of another, we're a family? Are we going to keep current with our anger so that it doesn't continue to spill into our lives and and control us? Or are we going to allow it to rule us make us bitter, allow us to have wrath, allow us to yell at each other, allow for slander to happen, and ultimately for physical and emotional pain. This morning I want to pray as as we close, but I want to leave an opportunity, a few minutes, for you guys to just allow the Holy Spirit to search our lives, search all of our lives, to ask Him if there is somebody or something, or some situation or circumstance that you've been angry at, and that you haven't dealt with that anger. Maybe that anger is still there. You may not even know that it's there, but it's still there. Allow the Holy Spirit time to work on our hearts this morning, and I would highly encourage you to deal with that anger today before the sun goes down. Don't allow that wrath to, to, that sun to set down your wrath again. We have an opportunity, we have a privilege to be able to look at the Word of God face to face 
and react to it. So I'm going to give us that opportunity this morning. We'll give it a few minutes of quiet, pray, ask the Lord to search your heart, and then I'll close. Father God, this morning we come to you. We are just so thankful that you are forgiving. That you don't hold your anger against us. That even though the transgressions that we've committed against you as a holy, perfect, and righteous God, even though those transgressions are so horrible, and you would have every righteous right in the world to be angry at us and to punish us that you don't. We thank you for that this morning, Father. We thank you for your grace. But this morning, Lord, as we've worked through this passage in Ephesians, as we've worked through this idea, this this topic of conflict and and communication in conflict, Lord, we know that we've, we've probably screwed up. That there's people, that there's maybe groups of people that we're still angry with, that we need to deal with. Lord, we just pray this morning that you would reveal that to us. Reveal in our hearts, Lord, that which is hidden, that which we've tried to hide. Bring that to the front so that we can walk in unity, in fellowship, in love with one another, but ultimately as a perfect reflection of who you are. Father, this morning I just pray that if there is situations in our lives that you would give us the opportunity, that you would prod us, that you would just work on our hearts to deal with those issues, to talk to those people, to open communication up so that the conflict doesn't continue, so that the anger doesn't fester, so that bitterness doesn't take root. Lord, we pray for grace. We pray for your, your hand upon us. Father, we pray as we continue throughout this series in Ephesians, as we continue to look at your word, that you would keep revealing things in our lives that we need to get rid of, that we need to put on new, and that we need to get closer to you with. Lord, we pray that your name would be honored and glorified this morning in all that we say and all that we do, that that our speech would always be gracious and seasoned with salt. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.